This will be Ecclesiastes chapter 10, and we're going to look at the subject of things to remember while you're digging your pit. In Ecclesiastes 10.8, it says, He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it, and whoso breaketh an hedge, a serpent shall bite him. So I'm going to give you some things to remember while you're digging your pit, while you're digging your own grave, plotting your own death, destroying your own life, going in the way of the devil, you're digging your pit. Here's some things to remember on the way. Okay, starting in Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 1, it says, Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. So an apothecary is someone who prepares medicine like at a pharmacy. And if flies get in the medicine and die, then it makes the ointment stink. So dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. If you dig a pit with your sin, the flies will come out. The flies will start coming out. When they die, it will stink up your testimony. So Solomon says, So doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. A little folly will make your reputation stink. If a person who is high class and has a big rep among people is caught in some type of scandal, the dead flies will come out and start ruining his reputation. It could ruin the testimony of a pastor. Notice it only takes a little folly. The flies will eat you up just like they did in Egypt. In Psalm seventy-eight forty-five, he sent diverse sorts of flies among them which devoured them. They say they puke every time they land on something. And I mean, if that's true, then you must have puke all over you. Because you've been digging your pit so long, you've done let all the flies come out. You've ruined your rep and you've ruined your testimony. Now, that doesn't mean you can't get it back, but you've done some damage. A common saying is, well, he wouldn't hurt a fly. Well, in this case, you should hit, hit it with a fly swat, pull its wings off, and then throw it on the ground and stomp on it. You don't want these dead flies coming in and stinking you, your testimony up. But that's what happens. That's something to remember. As you're digging your pit is... You're going to let the dead flies out. The next thing, a fool walks right into his own pit. While you're digging your pit, you're going to end up walking right into it. Ecclesiastes 10, 2, and 3. A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart at his left. Yea, also, when he that is a fool walketh by the way, his wisdom faileth him, and he saith to every one that he is a fool. Your wife doesn't have to wear a t-shirt that says, I'm with stupid, or I'm with this fool. As soon as you put your shovel down, you fell in the pit faster than Cora did in the book of Numbers, and you took your journey to the center of the earth. I mean, nobody had to tell nobody that you were a fool, most times. Have you ever been sitting outside of Walmart waiting on your wife to get done grocery shopping, and some guy pulls through Walmart parking lot like 50 times with his system shaking the roof he thinks he's so cool but really he saith to everyone that he is a fool i mean you didn't think to your in your mind well this guy's so cool you thought man what an idiot people think that they're so cool yet they're being an idiot and a fool walks right into his own pit that's something to remember as you're digging your pit another thing is you think everything is fine as you dig your pit. That's the third thing. While you're digging your pit, you think everything is fine. Ecclesiastes ten four through 6. If the spirit of the ruler rise up against thee, leave not thy place, for yielding pacifieth great offenses. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun as an heir which proceedeth from the ruler. Folly is set in great dignity, and the rich sit in no low place. As you dig your pit, you are highly exalted in the eyes of the world because folly is set in great dignity and the rich sit in low place. Eminem has a song where he says, I want to dig my way to hell. So he's digging his pit 
and he is set in great dignity. Folly set in great dignity. And Amos 9.2 says, Though they dig into hell, thence shall my hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven, thence will I bring them down. Since the devil is giving him fame and fortune in exchange for his soul, he believes he's fine as he's digging his pit. He's being taken care of. I mean, the devil's coming and he's wiping the sweat off his forehead. He's bringing him some lemonade. He's bringing him some pizza. He's uh, letting him sit in a lawn chair every now and then and have a little rest. And he's not realizing the devil is only providing for him until he, can, he can't dig the pit anymore. And then he can't get back out of the pit and he's thirsty. And the devil ain't going to give you water while you're down there. He gives it to you on the way down. The fool who digs his pit, it, he sits in great dignity among the people because the idiots of the world are highly exalted. You normally find them on the trending section of YouTube. You frequently see them on magazine covers. And when you're in high school, they are rebellious and they're the most popular people just because they're so wicked. They are taken care of as they dig the pit because they're making their own grave and they're going to make other people fall in that pit too. But notice Solomon said, also said the rich sit in low place. At least the ones who are rich in the eyes of God. The Lord says to the church in Smyrna, Revelation 2, 9, I loathe thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. So this is one way you can look at it. The rich sit in low place. The ones who are rich in the eyes of God aren't exalted. You're in a low place. You may not have money, but you have Jesus Christ, and you're trying to live holy, and you're not going along with the world, so the world has you in a low place. You're not in the VIP section. I think that's one way you can look at that verse. He said to that church, Smyrna, I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. So just because you don't have a bunch of money and you don't get along with the world, this doesn't mean you're not rich in the eyes of God. But you're not going to be set in great dignity like that person who's out there digging their pit. Ecclesiastes 10.7 I have seen servants upon horses and princes walking as servants upon the earth. And it's like this in any field. You see the servants on the horse and the princes walking as servants. And it, ain't that the way it goes? Everywhere you go? All the preachers on TV couldn't preach their way out of a wet napkin. All the good preachers are almost unheard of. The foolish preacher is set up in a high place. And the godly preachers are not highly exalted. The uh, foolish TV preachers, they got the following... They got the money. They got the crowd. It's like they're the ones, they're riding up on horses. They're highly exalted. And then the good ones, they're living like servants. Just like your regular factory worker. There are tons of singers with real talent that nobody knows. Nobody has no idea who they are. They could sing better than anybody on the radio. But they are servants upon horses. And then yet everybody knows who Demi Lovato and Lady Gaga and Miley Cyrus and Ariana Grande is. These people are exalted mostly for being wicked. They, are, they should be servants. But yet they're walking as princes. But then it's crazy at the same time. They are actually the servants. Because they are serving their sin. They're serving their own flesh. They think they're free, but they're not. Being, being able to go out and drink and fornicate and do what you want to do does not mean you're free. Because you're actually just a slave to that stuff. But while you're digging your pit, you think that you're the one on the horse. But that's something you need to remember as you're digging your pit. The next thing is, the serpents will come out of the pit. You start digging your pit, the serpents are going to come out. 
Ecclesiastes 10, 8, He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it, and whoso breaketh an hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Just keep digging your pit. You're going to dig, and you're, you're going to dig yourself into it. If you dig that pit long enough and break hedges, the serpent will come out and bite you. And some people don't care. They think they can handle snakes like those people up in the mountains. They like to wrap the snakes around their backs and walk around. Little Nas X likes to dress up like one of his music videos. Uh, this goes for Christians too. If you keep messing around and digging a pit, you're going to break the hedge and a serpent will bite you. Sin will get you in trouble. And once you let it bite you, it is like venom and it will spread to your whole body and then your family. Ecclesiastes 10, 11, sure the serpent, Surely the serpent will bite without enchantment and a babbler is no better. People use music and dancing to charm the cobras and then they bend down and kiss the snake. But if you keep playing around with snakes... You're going to get bit. Surely the serpent will bite without enchantment. And the babbler is no better. A babbler has the poison in their lips, just like the snake. Romans 3.13 says, Their throat is an opal and sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. And they'll help you dig the pit. Next, digging the pit wears you out. Ecclesiastes 10.9 Whoso removeth stones shall be hurt therewith, and he that cleaveth wood shall be endangered thereby. Removing stones that marks a place where you don't belong will just leave you hurt. Whoso removeth stones shall be hurt therewith. Don't go around removing stones that's marking off boundaries that you shouldn't go over. Around the pit you're digging are danger signs that you had to walk by to begin digging. And this could have been warnings from teachers, warnings from preachers, from parents, or just from seeing the experience of others who dig their pit and fell in. You saw them remove stones and go past the danger signs and rock, walk right over there to start digging their pit. Whoso removeth stones shall be hurt therewith, and he that cleaveth wood shall be endangered thereby. When you cleave wood, the axe can slide off and hit your body, and you think you're making progress, and then the axe head hits you right in the face, and you're just worse off than, than you were when you started. Just like digging your pit, you think you're really going somewhere, and then the serpent bites, or you start to fall in, and digging the pit just wears you out. You can get hurt along the way to remind you of what you're doing. But that's a blessing if you're getting hurt along the way. The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. And sometimes the goodness of God is Him putting things in your way to hurt you and to stop you from further ruining your life. That is God being good to you. Ecclesiastes 10 and verse 10. If the iron be blunt and he do not wet the edge... Then must he put to more strength, but wisdom is profitable to direct. So if the iron be blunt, if the iron isn't sharp, he has to put more force and more wax into it. You need to wet the edge. You need to sharpen the edge. You can't sharpen your sword digging a pit. You sharpen your sword by going home and reading the scriptures. Then you'll find your way out of the pit. Wisdom is profitable to direct. It'll show you your way out. Maybe, you're, maybe you've dug yourself in a pit and you're in it right now. Somebody's going to throw, throw you a Bible, start reading it. Wisdom is profitable to direct. It can tell, tell you how to get out. The way of transgressors is hard. It will wear you out. Sometimes 25-year-olds look 50 because of all that pit digging. The next thing, the pit just might be your own mouth. While you're digging your pit, you may realize the pit just might be your own mouth. Ecclesiastes 10.12 says the words 
of a wise man's mouth are gracious, but the lips of a fool will swallow up himself. Gracious means favorable, kind, ben benevolent, merciful, disposed to forgive offenses, and impart unmerited blessings. If you are gracious, gracious with your words, then you talk to people in a kind way that they don't even deserve to be talked to in. A wise man does... He, do, he does that because a wise man knows. Proverbs 15, 1 says, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious, but the lips of a fool will swallow up himself. The lips of a fool will swallow up himself. He sticks his foot in his mouth. He eats his words. He gets literally full of himself. It says in Ecclesiastes 10.13, The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is mischievous madness. The whole thing is just ridiculous. From the moment he starts talking to the moment he's done talking. Have you just ever just sat and listened to how a liberal talks today? It's foolish, unheard of nonsense from the time that they start talking until the time that they end talking. It's things that are unheard of. What they're saying. Complete nonsense. They're so wore out from digging their pit that they are disoriented. And this is who is on the talk shows. At the opening theme of the show, it should say foolishness and close out saying mischievous madness. That should have that as the end credits. These people should not have their own talk shows they should not have their own news shows. It's like their brain is gone. And they're saying the most foolish things that you never thought an actual person would say. But the pit is just their own mouth. Ecclesiastes 10.14 A fool also is full of words. A man cannot tell what shall be. And what shall be after him, who can tell him? A fool's mouth never stops. It keeps going and going and going like he has everlasting energizer batteries running his mouth. It keeps going and going and it just never stops. They, they think that they can tell you what's best for you. They think that they can tell you what's around the corner for you. Or these foolish psychics who are full of Words, a fool also is full of words. A man cannot tell what shall be and what shall be after him. Who can tell him? Certainly not a psychic. When I was younger, I would prank call psychics as like when I was like 10. Because you know, they had all these commercials, these psychic commercials saying, Call this number now. And one time I actually got through a couple times to one and, uh, I said, if you're a psychic, how did you not know that I wasn't 18 or older? Because you got to be 18 and 18 or older to call. So how did I, I said, how did I get through to you if I'm not even 18? You should have known that if you're a psychic, right? And they said, have a nice life, kid, and hung up. <clears throat> I didn't know what that meant. Maybe he saw something in my future that wasn't good. Yeah, right. But I ended up getting that charged on my mom's credit card or something. But um, nobody can tell you what's going to be after you. Who can tell him? Those people are foolish. Miss Cleo is foolish. I mean, where's she at now? You don't see her on TV no more. A fool's mouth never stops. It keeps going and going and going like he has everlasting... Energizer batteries or something. Ecclesiastes 5.2 says, Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon earth, therefore let thy words be few. If the fool swallows up himself, then maybe his mouth is the pit that he falls into. Your mouth can get you into a mess. It can ruin your testimony. It can ruin other people's testimony. It can get somebody killed. One call to a hitman, and your mouth can tell a man to kill another man. Ecclesiastes 10.14 O 
A fool also is full of words. A man cannot tell what shall be and what shall be after him. Who can tell him? Nobody can tell you what will be after you. Yet you call psychics who sin with their mouth so that they can tell you where you're supposedly going to be in 15 years. And you give these people your hard-earned money. All they are is a bunch of crooks. Ecclesiastes 10.15 The labor of the foolish wearieth every one of them, because he knoweth not how to go to the city. In the tribulation, the fool, had, fool doesn't know how to go to the city. That would be Petra, where the Lord will take care of the Jews. The slothful man doesn't know how to go to the city, so he eats his own flesh. The lost man today is so engobbed in the world system, he doesn't know how to go to the city. Even though he is a city slicker, and he's never been out in the country. And I'm talking about a heavenly city. He may live in the city, but he doesn't know how to get to the heavenly city. He, Hebrews 11.10 talks about the heavenly city. It says, For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God, not Cain. Ecclesiastes 10.16 Woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a child and thy prince is eaten in the morning. The man who's digging his pit doesn't have enough sense to know that he shouldn't have a king that's a child. Isaiah 3, 4 says, And I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule, shall rule over them. When a child is your king, you're in trouble. When a child is your king, it shows the adults lacked wisdom. Ecclesiastes ten seventeen, Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles, and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. So it talks about princes that eat in the morning and princes that eat in due season. The princes eating in the morning are partying and eating and drinking for drunkenness. Because in verse 17 it says, And thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. So when it says thy princes eat in the morning, it's talking about them eating and drinking for drunkenness. If they eat in due season, then they're eating at regular times. And Elijah was fed once in the morning and once in the evening, two meals a day, when he was fed by the ravens. You have these people today saying you need to eat six times a day. That wouldn't go good for some people. Ecclesiastes 10.18, By much slothfulness the building decayeth, and through idleness of the hands the house droppeth through. So the guy with idle hands will sit around in his house and spill so much Captain Crunch and beer in the floor and never pick it up. His house is a wreck because not only is he too lazy to work, but he's also too lazy to clean. And then his wife doesn't even have enough in energy to give their babies a bath or make them a PB&J sandwich. Laziness paints a disgusting picture. By their slothfulness and lazy hands, the building decays, their house drops through, and they have went so long with, without hearing an alarm clock that if one of them was actually going off in their house, they would think they missed the rapture and that their grandma was right all those years. It's, it's a very disgusting picture that slothfulness paints. Men today have idle hands. They, go, they might go put in an application at the workplace just so that they can get their wife off their back. They work for a week and then they're back playing Madden the following Monday, eating Cheetos and wiping their hind end is about all they use them hands for. They have idle hands and an idle mind. They sit around watching violence on video games, watching porn, and watching violent movies. If their mind was a city, you wouldn't be able to walk down the streets of that city. It would look like a jungle. We are living in a time where you have sane people on one side who think that an eight-year-old boy is an eight-year-old boy. And then the other side thinks the eight-year-old boy can be whatever gender he wants to be. That's where we're at. People are crazy. And that comes from people having an idle mind that the devil can invade their whole life. 
Ecclesiastes 10.19, A feast is made for laughter, and wine maketh merry, but money answereth all things. So money answers all things. Well, that is where you get the common saying, money talks. 1 Timothy 6.10, For the love of money is the root of all evil. If you love money, it talks even more. It talks more than the fool does. It just won't shut up. Some people are so concerned with money that money is all they even talk about. They really put their money where their mouth is. The TV preacher gives you the idea that if you don't have $10 million, then you would have trouble serving God. Even though Jesus Christ said himself that you can't serve God in mammon. The wicked rap music genre is all about money. To them, money answers all things. As a kid, I used to listen to a lot of rap music. Snoop Dogg had a song that said, Mind on my money and my money on my mind. That's people today. Bone Thugs and Harmony have a song called For the Love of Money. Lil Wayne is on Cash Money Records. Jay-Z has a song called All About the Benjamins. That's all they talk about is money, money, money. And then they just... Throwing dollar bills around everywhere. They are paid millions to brainwash the masses. And as an extremely young kid in the late 90s and early 2000s, I was brainwashed by this junk. So I had to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. And while you're digging your pit, the devil throws money at you. Wicked men will do wicked things because money answereth all things. Ecclesiastes 10.19, A feast is made for laughter, and wine maketh merry, but money answereth all things. So a feast is made for laughter. For this reason, Ecclesiastes 7.2 and 3 says, It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men, and the living will add to his heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance the heart is made better. So a feast is made for laughter, and sorrow is better than laughter, and it's better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting. It's better to stay in a burden and sorrowful for, sorrowful for somebody than it is to stay in laughter because you're not made better in the house of feasting and in laughter. You're made better when you go through something. I think feasting is more than just with the mouth. It can also be with the eyes. Therefore, they have the saying, feast your eyes on this. When you dig your pit, the devil will have a pretty picture of a hoish woman dressed up like a stripper. This way you keep digging. Then you get to the bottom and she looks like the crypt keeper in a grandma dress or something. And Proverbs seven twenty six through 27 says, For she hath cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. You're digging your pit, trying to get to this whorish woman. And then you got down there, and her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. The devil puts a lot of enticing stuff in your face for you to feast your eyes on as you dig your pit. But you're going to have to have your Bible goggles on, or you're going to get tricked. That means stay in the book every day. Because the devil will just pimp you out. He'll give you a little money to live on as he uses you to lead another soul to damnation. As you dig your pit, the devil uses you to throw other people in it. Ecclesiastes 10.20 Curse not the king, no, not in, the, in thy thought. And curse not the rich in thy bedchamber, for a bird of the air shall carry the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. When you dig your pit, you let the unclean birds out. In the trib, it talks about how Babylon will be the hold of every foul spirit in the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. In Revelation 16, 13, John says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. So unclean spirits are compared to animals sometimes, and unclean birds are one of them. And Ecclesiastes 10, 20 takes on some prophetic application as well because Imagine sitting in your home, living under the false kingdom of the Antichrist, and you have all the technology in your home that makes it for possible for him to hear anything that you're saying. The ghost in the machine picks up on your words and will tell the king. Curse not the king, no, not in thought, and curse not the rich in thy bedchamber. 
For a bird of the air shall carry the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. There's your unclean spirit, that which hath wings. And this is where you get the saying, a little bird told me. And it says, Curse not the rich in thy bedchamber. Do you know why? Money answereth all things. If they are rich, then they have enough money to have you whacked. And then call it a suicide. The rich men in the trib will all be antichrist henchmen because you have to have the mark to buy or sell. They're going to have power to do things. And those people that go against them in the trib will be in danger of their lives. But sometimes the pit can be your mouth. And, some, and digging your pit is never good. You need to drop the shovel down Turn to the Lord Jesus Christ before you've dug your own grave.